Sounds good. Good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for joining us at Yeshiva University's World of Tomorrow conference. I'm Shlomo Zukir. I'll be chairing this very exciting panel this morning. A quick audio autobiographical note. Um, I'm a student in the Kola Elyon here, a PhD candidate in genetic studies at Yale University. And most relevant to our panel, uh, I was previously uh, an educator at uh, JLIC at Yale, uh, spending three years there. Our topic for the next hour is textual learning and what that might look like in the world of tomorrow. All three talks on our panel consider the way that cutting edge contemporary trends, whether in the realm of ideology or technology, pose both challenges and opportunities for Jewish education today and for the future. In order to properly capture the topic of textual learning, which of course is paramount to Judaism throughout the ages, our speakers will consider both the phenomenon of study itself as well as some broader factors, including the state of modern orthodoxy, the nature of today's generation of students, and the ways in which today's and tomorrow's children will learn. Our speakers will offer several different perspectives on the challenges posed by text study to tomorrow's students, on the formation of one's religious identity surrounding Torah study, and on methods to optimize student engagement. We're going to give them each about 10 minutes to speak, uh, following which we'll have time uh, for questions. Uh, our, our panel consists of Mrs. C.B. Nugrishel, who will be followed by Rabbi Tzvi Sinensky and Dr. Moshe Rakowski. Mrs. C.B. Nugrishel is head of school of Yeshiva University High School for Girls. She is an educator with over 20 years of experience in both Judaic and general studies. Before coming to YU High School for Girls, Mrs. Nugrishel served as assistant principal and co-director of general studies at SAR High School. Thank you very much. Um, I hope the mic is working. Uh, if you give me um, a little bit of your perspective and patience, I want to lay the groundwork for, before we talk about tomorrow, for where we are and how we've gotten here. Um, when I think about textual learning, the echo sounds very strong to me. Is it okay if you guys? When I think about textual learning and where we're going, where we are, I can't really begin without um, outlining a perspective of where we've come from. Um, over 20 years ago, I was asked to write a brief reflection for a small effort of the Orthodox Caucus. It was called the Call to Discussion, the Women in Orthodoxy, Task, a Task Force of the Orthodox Caucus. Um, and um, under those circumstances, 20 years ago, I still find what I wrote then very relevant um, and really important as we outline where we're going and where we are. For me, technology and text seem to be at odds with each other. Um, and yet, one of the words that jumps out is access. Technology provides access, text provides access, maybe in different ways. And access was something that as a young student, as a young teacher, as a member who was striving to be a part of the Talmud Torah phenomenon of my community, I never had. So if I can read to you very briefly uh, my reflections about 20 years ago, I'm curious when you hear them whether they resonate. Simply titled Women's Torah Education. When it came to Torah study, I perceived two core realities in the, in the schools of my youth. On the one hand, the Lydia Kodesh, all subjects included, involved pedantic and mechanical memorization of what seemed to be endless lists of predetermined facts, interpretations, and opinions. There was no room, no time, and no inclination to personalize the learning process by seeking out the individual voices through the process or insight. We sat quietly and copied copious notes, never presuming to inch our way beneath the surface of the material with probing questions or thoughtful insights. Becoming intimately familiar with the method of Torah study was not amongst my school's educational goals. Molding obedient and observant of Orthodox Jews what girls was. Understanding the Jewish life we were living was left to others. On the other hand, we knew that knowledge of Torah was the source of living a divinely inspired life. We knew that the sages of yesteryear and today had delved and were delving into the Torah with their entire intellectual arsenal. We knew that there were reasons and answers. They were simply beyond our reach. There was scant mention of the name, titles, terms of halakhic sages, and texts, positions, and ideologies. While their presence was invoked to validate religious practice, theirs was a territory into which we could not venture. 
We dutifully learned what they had studied, but it did not and, to, and could not truly become our own. Somehow, Torah education had found me. Today, 20 years ago, as I look at the eager faces of my female students, I see reflected in them the fact that the dichotomies of my youth no longer exist. The sense of removed wonder at the inaccessibility of Torah is replaced with the comfort of well-worn texts. The notion of a complicated halakhic labyrinth is an invitation to explore, to grapple, and to reach understanding. Torah has become the bedrock of a woman's belief, offering a context for her experience and a voice for her thoughts. That I have learned more from my students than from my teachers is thus inescapable. I have learned that even without years of traditional Beit Midrash training, a woman's spiritual and intellectual yearnings will lead her to claim her place within the legacy of Torah studies. 20 years ago, texts to me looked, Torah texts, to me, it looked like they were just beginning to become accessible. Very different from the experience that I had in which they were at such a distant remove. However, over the last, in, in truth and in fairness, I did grow up in a different community where um, Torah study for women was not as uh, valued as I came to learn it was in Yeshiva University. However, what is really fascinating to me is that as access has continued to grow, and infrastructure and programs um, have um, developed to encourage and invite young women and older women to really explore text and Torah and to, and to develop their own language and insight, um, as has been very um, carefully articulated uh, by an essay that Esti Rosenberg, the Rosh Hashanah Josh of uh, Miguel Oz in Gush Etzion has written and, and published in 2012 in the Tradition article, reviewing the incredible growth of programs and the incredible growth of interest and the incredible growth of access to true total learning for three decades. I nevertheless believe that there is this continuum of challenge and, and tension between um, the same issues of what happens when we do have access and is that access going to um, deepen and encourage um, a, uh, a thoughtful continuum within the traditional community? I want to mention the challenge that I recognize now, um, which I don't believe is unique to uh, women's learning, and I don't believe is unique only to Torah learning. Um, this comes from uh, both from a, a realization of the growth of academia in general, um, and the access that uh, technology and digital texts um, have made available to everyone in every <coughs> field. Um, on the one hand, uh, I believe this was in 1995, um, in the review, in a review, in Neil Musselter's review of uh, Yosef Yerushalmi's Zafor, um, he reflects that this generation of Jews has more academic knowledge of its past and of its um, tradition than any generation prior, and yet is even less connected, perhaps, than it ever has been. We know more and we care less. Um, and that's an interesting challenge. Um, and this was, this was a reflection he made on Jewish studies, not necessarily on Torah studies, right? On the academic insight that has now become um, so, so available, so accessible, um, and in some ways has created a greater remove um, from the deeper uh, connectedness that, um, that less knowledge may have, may have provided. So I see that as a phenomenon, that greater academic access sometimes produces less connectivity. Um, similarly, uh, Heinz Lovejic also posited in his, in his essay of Rapture and Reconstruction, um, that as we moved from a mimetic tradition to a textual tradition, and as we are now living in an age, and I don't say it's just our school, of, of not only print publication, but digital publication, where everyone is an author, and everyone has developed um, not only their own voice, um, but also the capacity to build a, um, an echo chamber that's customized to their own personal lives and interests, um, we find ourselves potentially not really engaging in the fullest breadth of understanding and therefore not really challenging ourselves to, uh, to, to get to the greatest depth of understanding. If I can speak just a minute to that, I'm not really sure what my time is, but I'll get it to you soon, I have two more minutes. If I can speak to a minute to 
that I think I'll then transition to is challenge for code text. Um, this is a huge challenge, and I don't mean just for the social emotional reasons or for habits and behaviors. It's a huge intellectual challenge because the greater technology um, and the profit motive of the technology giants is to help them and I think challenge us. The algorithms that are being designed are, are customizable and are building a great familiarity with their own echo chamber. There is like a Google cone around all of our own cell phones and our own um, search histories that give us what we want to hear and don't give us access to what we don't want to hear. Um, and, when, and when that happens, um, something else is also happening. Uh, as we are all now more comfortable reading online than we are perhaps in books, um, there's a phenomenon, and I think some of you may have heard of it, called the shallows, where a different part of your brain is being, is being stimulated um, and your eyes are typically flitting from screen, parts of the screen to parts of the screen as opposed to a text. Where we deeply, deeply, it's a different part of our brain that is being uh, stimulated, where we read deeply, and we read thoughtfully, and we read slowly, and we read cognitively as opposed to just socially. Um, and I do believe that these phenomena, the customization and the algorithms of our digital age, plus the shallows, plus the idea that everyone is now being trained to be, and everyone's an author, and opinions are being treated as facts, and that you can put a comment somewhere on someone else's post, and all of a sudden that becomes its own argumentation, and then only later on in the comments do people admit that they never really read, read the article. Um, those are phenomena that I think are a part of this, this issue of text and access. And while I am personally, professionally, and intellectually and religiously completely committed to continuous open access to all different forms of Torah, for women and for everybody else, I think it raises this challenge of how much uh, depth versus breadth is being um, introduced and trained for. I believe there are three um, principal uh, characters that we need to be um, cultivating in, in order to counteract this trend and this paradigm shift, and those include a perpetual, unremitting search for truth versus the skepticism of there being a truth. The second is that recognizing that we live in a common reality and we have to push beyond the um, comfort of the algorithms that customize and tell us what we want to hear. And number three is the cultivation of a personality of humility, um, which has always been a part of the Josh um, and now is in danger of not um, being there because we think we have it all. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, Tzvi Sinensky. Rabbi Tzvi Sinensky is Rosh Beit Midrash of Kohelet Yeshiva in Lower Marion, Pennsylvania, where he is the architect and lead teacher of a cutting edge community education program that was recently awarded the inaugural Kohelet Prize. Rabbi Sinensky recently authored book length treatment of the Jewish return to Zion during the Second Temple period, published by Yeshivat Haaretzion's virtual Beit Midrash. Started, I just want to give a shout out to a number of uh, family members here in the audience, my parents, and uh, some others as well. So <laughs> it's, actually, it's actually quite appropriate, and uh, you'll see why it's especially appropriate. So uh, it's, it's always an honor and a uh, pleasure and to, to be standing and sitting alongside uh, such esteemed uh, professional colleagues and outstanding scholars. Uh, every individual here uh, in their own right is really a tremendous honor for me. Uh, what I'd like to do today is to just speak uh, briefly uh, from another perspective, as Nudershell, I think, very insightfully delineated some of the challenges that our young women and really all of our young people face in terms of access to text in the 21st century. And I want to look at this from the perspective of some of my own students and some of my own experiences in the classroom, but to perhaps dig even deeper and to ask some foundational questions about how in today's world, and I think in the decades to come, our students are struggling some of the major challenges that perhaps they are facing and 
grappling with as they encounter text. Because when we go ahead and we engage with the text, when we're trying to understand on the surface, what we're trying to do is really just to gain that access and to gain the understanding and the inspiration and the buy-in that comes with that access. And yet I would suggest today that it's actually much deeper. There is so much that lies beneath the surface when our students are encountering those texts. And in particular, I want to introduce this through the thought of a sociologist of religion who passed away really just a very short time ago, someone by the name of Peter Berger. If you're familiar with the name, perhaps a couple. Peter Berger was a sociologist of religion. It's, uh, it's well beyond the scope of our discussion to go into all of his thought, but I want to take one piece of what he writes in his 1967 classic, <coughs> The Sacred Canopy. And the Sacred Canopy, I'm going to give just one piece of it. His thought is deeper and broader. I don't even, frankly, agree with everything he has to say. I'll put that out there. But the following, I think, is extremely insightful, and you'll see in just a few moments how it speaks to the struggle, the challenges of textual engagement or textual access for <coughs> students in the 21st century. Peter Berger essentially offers the following two terms or concepts. He says, first of all, go, this idea of the sacred canopy. <coughs> the idea of, well, I guess we'll put that up and you've seen that, the sacred canopy. The sacred canopy is as follows. He says, why is it that people are drawn to religion in general? Why is it that people are drawn to religion in particular in the 21st century? And he says, modernity is all about choice. He says, there was once a time when you lived in, uh, he doesn't actually use the term shtetl, although he was, uh, he was a Jew, but uh, essentially, there was a time in history when much of your life was already set out before you. You knew what you'd be studying, you knew your professional future, you knew your religious destiny, more or less with some exceptions around the edges, but basically, we lived in a world of destiny where everything was laid out for us before and yet in modernity, just the opposite is the truth. In particular, in today's world, our young people, and we ourselves, we know this experience, we are bombarded, as was noted. We are bombarded not just by different <laughs> texts, by different ideas, competing ideas that are whole, that are holistic, that have the aim of almost a comprehensive vision, and they want to vie for our spirit. They almost, as it were, vie for our very soul. Says Peter Berger, this is an incredibly chaotic and confusing world in which to live. This is an incredibly difficult and alienating world in which to grow up. And he says the purpose of religion from a descriptive or sociological perspective is in many cases to allow me as an individual to find some sense of stasis, some, si some sense of stability, a buoy in a raging sea of the world and the dirty. There's so many options out there. How do I find some stability? How do I know, as it were, even on technical matters, what to order from Starbucks? How do I know how to begin to make these choices in my life? Well, the answer is in a world of choice, to find an anchor, to find a worldview. And he says we often find that in the world of religion. And yet he asks, well, if we find religion to find stability in our lives, then how is it that sometimes we abandon? Why is it that we sometimes we jump ship? And here comes the idea of the plausibility structure. And Peter Berger posits that our lives are lived in the modern world in tension between the modern commitments, how we are growing up, the values that we've imbibed from the world around us, and our religious commitments. He says the fundamental question is not whether or not there will be tension. We all experience tension. That's what it means to be religious in the modern world. We're torn at times between different values, values like autonomy versus commandedness. We'll come back to you in just a moment. We need to make very difficult decisions, and they always exist in tension. The question is, can we bear the tension? Is it light? Is it soft enough that we can maintain our sacred canopy, our religious worldview that gives us a sense of refuge, a sense of purposefulness, a sense of direction, a sense of meaning in our lives? Or do we jump ship? Do we abandon it? He says the answer is it depends on whether or not there is a plausibility structure. By that he means that if I can no longer see a possibility of marrying or at least living with my secular or modern commitments and my Jewish commitments, that, he says, will determine the course of my future, whether or not I will stay in it. Is there a plausibility structure? <coughs> Are the different parts of my lives compatible? Can they coexist? Can they not? What I want to suggest in brief is that when our students engage with text, actually, it's so much more than meets the eye. It's actually a lot deeper. And I think our students are grappling with at least five fundamental questions. See, we think sometimes, if you have a black and the only question they're asking is, do I understand it or do I not? 
Do I have access to it or do I not? Is that sufficient is the question. And I would pose the answer that the, I would posit that based on Berger, the answer is not even close. I think we heard echoes of this earlier as well. Just because our students understand the text or are thinking about the questions, can I, can I not understand the text, does not necessarily guarantee that they actually understand or are on board with the meaning of the text, that this is able to be assimilated into their own plausibility structure. First of all, when our students engage with text, the question of accessibility. All the text, when I read in social media, it's all consumerist. It's all been prepackaged for me. When I go to my Twitter account, they're now considering, I heard, expanding Twitter to 280 characters. Anyone hear this? A revolution, 280 characters in a single tweet. Who ever heard of such a thing? It's unimaginable. Everything in our world is so easy, so accessible, and yet the Jewish text, at least at first glance, seems so foreign, seems so difficult. There's a tension, there's an implausibility there. Our students ask, why would I want to sit in this seat when everything over there is so hunky dory, so comfortable? Why should I bother? Let me stay over there in the dirty where it is comfortable, the challenge of access. And then number two, the challenge of relevance. So we teach our students Baba Kama. So we have an ox that gores, and we're wondering, and they're wondering the classic question, what does that have to do with us? So maybe we answer, well, it's really about car accidents for us. That's the modern application, and so on and so forth. But our students are grappling with the question, is this relevant to who I am? If it's not speaking to my real problems, as a real kid growing up in a real world, in my experience, what we consider, or what they consider, my own real world, is it really relevant? Is it really part of my own sacred canopy, or should I put it over there and discard it? Challenge number two. We'll get this right at some point in time. I'm done. Challenge number three engagement. Everything nowadays is two points up. So much of what we do out there in the world on social media. We're chatting, we're engaging. There's a text, but there's a conversation. Someone throws up an idea, and I become part of the conversation. When you open up that block or you open up a page of Chumash, it's not necessarily always immediately obvious that I am part of that conversation. Our students say, am I part of this or not? Am I engaged? Is this 1.0? Is it talking to me? Or do I talk back at the text, as it were, or at least respectfully engage with it as part of what Rosalovich called in such a beautiful moving phrase, am I a member of the Misora community? And I think that's challenge number three, but I think the last two are actually the greatest. Because if they haven't been challenging yet, the problems I mentioned of autonomy versus a sense of authority. When our students learn how to quote Shabbat or quote Kashua, more than that, when they learn about how I should dress and how I should engage in acts of intimacy and sexuality in these areas, why should I bother some of our students are grappling with the question? Why should I abandon this easy world that tells me whatever I want is king or queen, that's how I should live my life, and I should give it over to this text that dictates for me why I should necessarily live my life in this particular way, the challenge of authority versus autonomy. Our students are learning halakha. They're asking these questions. They're bubbling forth from beneath the surface. Can I hold these two together, or do I have to choose one or the other? And then finally, questions of morality, particularly egalitarianism in our world, is exceedingly challenging. High schools teach, I don't know what they do at, uh, I don't know if you teach uh, Kiddushin, maybe we talk about teaching Kiddushin. So I'll share my experience, and I'd love to hear from others, because I've argued this with high school teachers literally uh, across many institutions. So for me, when I teach girls and boys in different ways, Masecha Kiddushin, and I open, Ha'isha Niknet, a woman is purchased, that seems to be, at least at first glance, the face meaning of this text. And I teach that to my 11th or 12th grade girl or boy in my classroom. And they're asking the question, well, Anisha Niknik, I'm being purchased, or God forbid, as it were, but the idea does flash through our students' minds. Is this a misogynistic system? God forbid, Khalil of Achas. But they're asking these questions. That's real. So we're trying to teach them. What's the Gemara saying? What's Rashi? What's so? That's not where their minds always are. Sometimes they're also asking, can I locate myself? A question of identity. Where am I vis-a-vis -vis this text? Is it part of my sacred canopy? Can this be plausible? Can I reconcile my own commitments that I've imbibed from my youth through modernity, or can I not think these are so many of the fundamental questions that we're grappling with? Now, these are hard questions. They complement what Mr. Nugashel spoke about. And I don't have time in my next 60 seconds of shop that's wrong yet. Maybe we have to turn it off. But uh, I know I'm, I'm out of time, running out of time. So I'm not going to give all the answers. And I will in a moment turn over to Dr. Krakowski for one type of either solution or a way around to some of these challenges. But I think they're considerable. But I want to say just uh, one last word in 60 seconds. 
about a roundabout way of addressing this issue because if Berger is all about the thickness, the depth, the reality of that plausibility structure of that sacred canopy, well then the thicker our communities, sacred canopies are, the less likely our students are to run away as soon as they find conflicts. Because according to Berger, there will always be conflicts, there will always be tensions, and of course we need to address those in the classroom. That goes without saying, but part of this, essential to our students' own, our children's own decisions, and uh, their, their priorities is how deep an eco, or how rich and thick an ecosystem they are living in. The more alive that it is, the more vibrant, the more compelling, the more all-encompassing, we all live with challenges. The question is, do those challenges push us over the edge and we're going to leave the community, or do I see the possibility for reconciliation? I spend, uh, as was mentioned, a lot of my life bridging between the school and the adult community. It's, it's much of my passion, it's much of what I do, and I think thinking holistically about this is very powerful. And uh, very quickly, just to include uh, one piece of Torah and then I'll sit down, a uh, comment of the Matthew. Rav Moshe Trani comments on the Rambam, and in turn really up from the Gemara, the Gemara Kedushin says that there, there is a conflict between a child learning and a parent learning. So the, the primary view in the Gemara, we rule as a matter of halacha, the parent comes first. Says the Ma'bit, Rav Moshe Trani asks, why should that be? And his answer is very basic. He says, well, essential to the mitzvah of teaching Torah, presupposed in that, is the notion that if I am meant to teach Torah, then I am meant first and foremost to know Torah on my own. The thicker the commitment, the greater the sacred canopy of textual commitment of learning, not just for our parents, but really for all of our communities, for their friends and their friends' parents and our shuls and our communities, all facets of our community, the greater the commitment to textual study, a passion for it, a love for it, the more our students will imbibe. But that is essential to their worldview, and I think be less likely to abandon it. So that, I think, is the beginning of an answer. It's not just a question of whether or not we resolve the tensions. There will always be a certain degree of tension. But if we can build up within and still within our students a model, a passion, not just as teachers, but as an entire holistic, connected community for textual access, textual learning for the values and the depth that stand behind it, then I think we will have a fighting chance as we continue to create, create an environment really an ecosystem of our own communities, sacred canopy and Thank you very much for Sinesky. Our final speaker is Moshe Krakowski. Dr. Moshe Krakowski is an associate professor at the Israeli Graduate School. Prior to joining the faculty at Israeli, he spent two years as a postdoctoral scholar in the psychology department at the University of Chicago. Mm -hmm. see each other's slides beforehand, but some of the exact same terms uh, overlap. And, uh, and I have a, there's a relatively simple argument, but uh, there's a lot of dense background. Thankfully, some of that background, I think, was already expressed in the two talks. So uh, I'll get right into it, and, and uh, if, there's, if there's anything that needs clarification, and we can talk about it afterwards. Um, so I'm going to start just uh, with a somewhat provocative uh, question to put up on the screen. Uh, building off of the uh, prompt that was given to us for the session, how will we make the text and traditional models of Tom Torah relevant and resonant in the world of tomorrow? Um, from this question that I put up on the board, uh, you can see that I'm more concerned with right now uh, forget the world of tomorrow for a minute. Uh, I'm concerned about Torah resonating today and texts resonating today. And that's because there's a, at least a decent case to be made that there is somewhat of a crisis and that that crisis is connected to schools. And there's, just looking at, the, at these graphs at the bottom right-hand corner, 
This is data from this very recent Nishma research study uh, that shows uh, in a lot of respects, modern orthodoxy in America is not very stable. And it's not stable in a very particular way. It's not that the community is shifting to the right or to the left. It's that it's splitting apart in the center. The center is not holding. And, and the left is moving to the left. The right is moving to the right. Um, in particular, if you look at that bottom graph, the children of those on the left are falling off of observance at alarming rates. Um, and this is consistent with what I've seen in modern Orthodox schools where uh, there's already been a robust anecdotal data on kids uh, either becoming more American Haredi in their attitudes or uh, falling off entirely from Orthodox. And so that's new data. It confirms what a lot of people were seeing just in terms of society, in terms of schools. So we know what the ideal and the modern Orthodox school is a well-rounded general Andrew Day of education. The expectations are varied. Uh, unlike the Haredi context that I also study uh, Haredi schools, there is not the expectation that every student is going to be exclusively learning Torah for a very long time. Um, there is less self-directed learning in the high schools, um, not so much base measures, much more. Uh, uh, something like lecture. So instead of a high school student sitting in uh, an environment that looks something like this, you might see an environment that looks something like this. And that does not mean that there aren't iPads and computers and all sorts of innovative things, but the format, kids are sitting at desks in many cases, there's a teacher in front of the classroom talking to them or engaging with them in, in sometimes very productive ways um, and sometimes very interactive ways, but not like a base metric. And Yet one other thing that we know uh, in modern Orthodox schools from a robust uh, body of literature that uh, there is incredible disengagement in today's studies. When you talk to kids about what their favorite topics are, they do not like Gemara, they do not like Halacha. In general, they see academics and college prep in the secular side of the, uh, the curriculum as being more real and that the religious uh, material is imposed over their real lives or is extra, is not their real lives. And I think that this in part comes back a little bit to uh, what we heard about some of uh, uh, sociologist Peter Berger, which is not something uh, that I was thinking about uh, in great depth beforehand, but is certainly consistent. Um, so, so I don't think these two things, the, the patterns in society and the patterns in school are unrelated. I think that um, we have a lot of literature in general education, not in Jewish education, that uh, connects what happens in school with student identity. And that we know that schools encode so sociological and cultural norms, and certainly religious <coughs> schools do so. The modes of study in school, how you study something, what you choose to study, the way that you choose to study it, the expectations reflect and also help create specific patterns of engagement with society. And student learning can be viewed as a process of enculturation. Enculturation giving meaning and purpose to what I'm doing in, in uh, my class and in, in broader life that impacts who I understand myself to be in relation to what I'm doing. Am I, am I a, a kid in class just doing an assignment, or am I a scientist researching a scientific problem? Am I in class doing a Gemara class, or am I a Thomas scholar who is researching a real problem and a real subject? And so when we think about these facts about how school impacts identity generally, and we take it uh, and we look at how modern Orthodox schools relate to the broader world, I, I just want to focus on a few features of modern Orthodox life. Um, modern Orthodox life is marked by an absence of hierarchy and no pres prescribed life trajectory. Um, kids can be doing a lot of different things with the religious material that they learn. Some of them may end up spending years learning. Some of them may not learn much after high school, and it may be only a minimal part of their lives. There's, it's not like a Haredi trajectory where, uh, maybe like the old shadow, you know exactly what somebody's going to be doing at every step of the way. There's a very clear societal expectation. There's not. There are a lot of opportunities. 
But that means that people can do a lot of different things. And what that means is that schools can't assume a uniform context of use for the material that's learned in the class. And that's probably the most critical piece here, is that the relationship between what happens in the classroom and broader society and what happens down the road is unclear. And that's not true at the secular end. In the secular end, it's pretty clear. But on the religious end, it's not clear what is the context of use for this material that will give it meaning. And so the meaning making of school activities is left is left unclear. And as a result, modernity and religion are intention in the school and often student identity by the way. So all of that is the problem. I think the problem was already articulated uh, to a certain degree. Uh, okay, so so let me let me talk about something that's happening in some schools, um, inquiry-based education, and why inquiry-based education may be uniquely suited to address some of these problems. And I'm not claiming this is this big solution that's going to solve all the problems, but reasons to think that it does something unique that is especially relevant to the issues that, that are being discussed. And so, in particular, I'm going to focus on problem-based or project-based learning, which is one form of inquiry learning. And uh, I'll give you the very brief overview. Problem or project-based learning does not mean just doing projects in a classroom. It does not mean, um, it does not mean uh, experiential. I mean, it is experiential often, but that's not exactly what it means. It doesn't mean progressive education. What it means is starting a curriculum by posing a real world problem or a project, something that is posed to the students before they've learned anything. And as a result of trying to solve this problem or complete this project, I learned what I learned. And that may cross cut different domains. It may be something that I'm interested in or something that I didn't know anything about beforehand. But I take ownership of the project as a student I try to work with peers and sometimes with outside community to solve this problem and to come up with a solution. Um, there's a strong, and I'll just mostly just highlight each one, there's a strong uh, theoretical cognitive base uh, from a learning perspective for why this should help learning having to do with constructivism, context, motivation, metacognition, and since Vygotsky we've already learned about the impact of social structures on learning. Um, I'll skip those because they're not actually as critical to what I want to say. And what I want to talk about more is the impact on identity. Um, not the learning features per se, but the identity features. What happens to identity when somebody is engaged in this type of curriculum? And I've observed this in schools. This is something that I've looked at. And I can tell you what I've seen. Number one, and this is where I'm um, putting up some of the very same uh, bullets that we saw in a previous uh, uh, talk. Um, oh, wow. Students, yeah, see, pretty good. did not coordinate these, right? So yeah. um, students have a tremendous amount of autonomy. And that doesn't mean that they decide what they're going to learn, although in some places they do. It means that within the project, within the task that I'm given, I have tremendous autonomy to bring into completion. It's not like a teacher giving me a color, color by numbers project, but a teacher says, go paint the picture. OK, but I can paint the picture how I like, and I can choose the colors, and I, it, I may be painting what the teacher wants me to paint, but it's mine. That gives me a tremendous amount of agency, and as a result, as a result, I'm engaged. We take, when we take ownership over things, we're engaged in them, and we want to do well on them. We want to, bring, we want to say something meaningful, um, and that means often engaging in incredibly authentic activities. And authentic, in this case, I mean the same sort of thing that somebody who is doing this for real might do. So somebody sitting in the base measures who's researching a sugi or a halakhic problem is going through all sorts of different makoros to try to come up with a solution and to write uh, a psak din or just to come to a better understanding of the Talmudic concept. That's what students are doing. That's what they're doing when they're engaged in these curricula, and as a result, the material becomes relevant to them. And I want to be careful about relevance, and we could have had a whole panel on relevance. Um, re relevance is a double-edged sword. By relevance, I mean not 
to take something like Gemara, which is big and broad, and shrink it down to fit with some 15-year-old's life. What I mean is because this 15-year-old is taking agency over a Talmudic problem that may not have had any relevance to him or her beforehand, the material now is opened up to their lives. And so now I'm seeing connections to my life that I never saw before. And my life is now bigger to incorporate this. That's what I mean by relevance. And because I have agency and ownership over this, it becomes relevant to my life, and my life becomes relevant to this material. Um, students are engaging with content on their own terms. It connects to what's going on around them because they're the ones choosing it, and it integrates religious and secular knowledge in a way that I am calling sort of clunky, and I'll, I'll be, this is, this is it, millennial autonomous piecemeal identity something. Don't ask. Okay, I'll explain. <laughs> what I mean is that there are, I, I'm skeptical of a lot of the claims about how kids are changing today, but it is true that something, there are some things changing, and among those, this idea of autonomy, of choosing, of, of choices that we're making uh, about be all us all being authors, creating, that we are in charge of our own identities, that our identities are not prescribed for us, but that we're picking and choosing from the mosaic that's out here and assembling our identities, that is a feature of 21st century life that, in particular, millennials have very deeply imprinted. And what happens is when a student is engaged in the PBL uh, class, the student says, this is my research, this is mine. And, and because a student who is taking ownership over something is taking ownership over something that has Jewish texts and Jewish life and Jewish thought built into it, what's happening is it's no longer imposed from the outside. It's no longer the commandedness of something coming from the outside, but it's simply one of the many pieces that I am using to assemble something in my life. And because of that, it has the ability to speak for itself. The intrinsic meaning of the material is one of the pieces that I am grappling with on its own. And it, it's kind of a sneaky way of opening the door for Jewish texts to have meaning for students as they assemble those identities. And when they do assemble those identities, these become pieces of those identities. And so I, I, I'll say that we don't know, at, you know that this is going to have an impact to solve all the problems at the, on the first page of graphs of the initial research. But certainly, I've seen it in, within the school, how it transforms student relationship to what it is that they're doing. And there's, it's not wrong to think that it's possible that it has an impact down the line, although we, we, we don't know. Thank you very much to all our presenters. We now have a few minutes for questions. Um, so please raise your hands and uh, we'll, we'll go around and try to speak loudly because the mic doesn't, doesn't work as well as it should in the world of tomorrow. Thank you very much. Just so, on a fundamental level, you have a ninth grader high school boy or high school girl and they are learning more. What would you tell them as a parent why AD should learn tomorrow and B, how the bar should be relevant to them. And you can take any step to that you want. Are you asking me or? Anyone. All three. Uh, anyone that wants to answer the question. I mean, I'm, I'm happy. Uh, personally, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't try to make that case, uh, honestly. Uh, I mean, uh, I. But if the kid says he doesn't, or she says, this is, this is the case, the case that I would make is not nearly as good as the case the Gemara can make. And that's, that's the truth. I would, to, to attempt to convince something, someone, that something is worthwhile, it doesn't work in any other domain. I, I don't, I've never seen... Not in math, and not in science, and yeah, not in Gemara. Correct. I, I've never seen a math teacher explain to kids why, you know, the math teacher, oh, well, you'll need this to pay your bills down the well, road or do your mortgage. No, no kid. Or, or architectural school. Science, if you want to become a scientist or if you want to understand different things, how do you make the Gemara relevant to a kid that will help them? So, so I, again, my personal, and the panelists can, can respond, other panelists can respond as well. My personal belief is that, there, that that never works in any domain and that the only way ever 
to show the relevance of something to someone is to show it from the inside and to show what it's like. And you, you appreciate things when you see what there is to appreciate in them. And I can't imagine anyone who's ever learned Gemara hasn't seen how unbelievably fascinating and interesting it is. It's, it's not a field that, that is you know, dull and boring. There's, there is so much in there. I mean, you know, there are tons of non-religious people in universities who spend their lives, non-Jewish people in universities, who spend their lives fascinated by this because it's such an unbelievably rich and powerful thing. It, it doesn't need me. It doesn't need me to show its relevance. It needs to just be able to speak. And if you find a way to let it speak for itself, I, I, more, not every kid's gonna like it because not every kid likes any, every subject. But just like any other subject, when it speaks for itself, it has the ability to make the case better than I can. But I think what Dr. Kukowski is saying is that the challenge is in the craft. The challenge isn't in the subject necessarily. Our society has presented a certain challenge in the way in which our students and ourselves are approaching traditional ideas and traditional texts. Knowing that that challenge exists, we have opportunity to craft around it. Um, the same way that you could uh, look at a trigger film or look at an ethical case, you choose, you choose Sugyo in uh, Sanhedrin in order to, and design an invitation to look for the complexity that's present and that elevates the entire enterprise as opposed to saying to them, listen, you're a Jewish kid, sit down, you're in yeshiva, open up the Gemara and learn. That approach is, is going to leave you with nothing. But recognizing that there's a craft involved here and inviting the complexity both of the student and uh, appreciating that their question is something that's a timeless question, putting them back into the context of the, of, of the text, immediately transforms the test from being an imposition to an invitation. Absolutely. Which is why I've always found his book Heretical Imperative much more uh, convincing than the uh, sacred candidate. Thank you for pointing it out. I, I think it's uh, I think it's fascinating. Right? I, ju I just had a hundred percent. I think it's uh, fascinating. I think that fits in very nicely because he points out that that word heretical is actually from the Greek initially of heresis, which means choice. And that's kind of his point. That's really a starting point. In fact, in the initial presentation, I had that, and I knew that, that uh, they'd cut me off, and I wouldn't get to the end. So, but I, I, I appreciate you it. Thank you, Dr. You just have to do like I do, and just keep on going. Well, you were you last. I, 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 I'm not a Bob Ice. I'm just came visiting. You, you know, this is your home, so. Also, home just, sure. just a quick note about heresy. Actually, Josephus was the first to use it as about uh, converting to different groups as well. So there's a, even a Jewish tie-in there in the ancient Greek uh, literature. Actually. Um, just to get back on topic, uh, I'd like to <laughs> pose a partial solution as, as, in a question form. Uh, each of you uh, mentioned how uh, teenagers, as we all, are searching for identity. They're searching for it, building it. The way I was taught to love Gemara is that I am in dialogue with my ancestors. I was not exposed to Hegelian dialectic philosophical principles at age uh, 13 or age 8 when I started the or whatever. But, um, but I did understand that. And it doesn't necessarily have to mean one's um, you know, direct uh, ancestors that I'm a direct descendant of. But since we are both a faith and a community, we are a people too, we you know, appreciate how the people on the text are actually speaking to each other over the centuries. People who never met are put in juxtaposition. And the Rishonim and Anachronim all refer to each other as if they're across the table in that famous uh, essay of Rabbi Salvation about his father with Rishonim around the table. So how is this idea conveyed? Mm -hmm. in, and I ask this of each of you as, as a way of um, getting a students interested in being in dialogue with their ancestors. Yeah, I'll speak to that. Um, 
I think I'm having a little bit of mic issues, so if I could just bounce, I think I appreciate it. I think that, that's such an important point. I think it's, a, it's an area for tremendous growth uh, in modern Orthodox schools. Uh, I'm sure not, not yours, um, hopefully not mine. We, I think we, we, can, uh, all, uh, we can all go in this area. I think it's so important. Um, I think that in our community, we shy away sometimes from Gedolim stories, and uh, I think that there's a, a reason for that and sort of the notion of Gedolatry, of like not overstating the case. It's a technical term that's been used before, <coughs> not mine. Um, but at the same time, I think this idea of roots is crucial. Um, there was a very important piece published in the New York Times a, a few years ago, The Roots That Bind Us, and significant research that telling stories about our families and about heroic individuals who are part of our own children's stories is, I think, uh, is, is essential to what we do. I see you're, uh, you had more to add, but I think, um, I, I do think that actually um, finding ways to draw connections between the Torah that we're teaching in the classroom and, uh, and giving a sense of personal identity um, for our students that they are in this tradition is very important, but I see you have more to add. You totally missed my point. I'm against Gadol and hangar I'm speaking about how <laughs> ideas mm -hmm. are treated with respect across the ages and how this 15-year-old's ideas were actually expressed. That Akron had that same question. I see. Baruch Kivanti kind of thing. Sure. So, That's yeah. the way I was taught to appreciate the value of my own ideas, and that developed. You're saying that that's the way. Yes. So there's an exercise. I mean, that's an exercise. That's actually a muscle that needs to be developed. It's not, it, and that's the question of moving from passive receptivity in learning to an active engagement. Um, and truthfully, I believe that the digital age and the technology that we're that we're using nowadays and integrated in our classroom actually makes that even more possible. There are teachers who are creating uh, blogs and commentaries and students asking and talking to each other. Um, what I try to reference in very short order is that I think there's this tension between um, inviting students in, ha to have a voice and training them to use that voice and at the same time cultivating a humility um, that requires them to be a bit more um, um, uh, determined than they are impulsive. Um, you know, when you have like a, a 40 uh, um, character tweet, which is a wonderful way of, of meeting students where they're at, um, in 40 characters, you can either be impulsive and frankly not really thoughtful, or you can be incredibly edited and very um, economic with your words, and learning how to do that is a skill just like any other skill. So I, I think that knowing the uh, sociological phenomenon of impulsivity and opinions um, posing as facts and research doesn't mean that we don't use those tools because that's where the kids are at and that's where the world is at, but it does mean that we have to have this corrective of, um, and, and a certain courageousness to, to ask kids to dig deeper than 40 characters, um, to invite them and then to challenge them, to show them that, you know, Baruch Shakivanti, but actually only the first two lines of Ramban, you, you hadn't gotten to the last pieces because that's much longer and harder to get there, um, and to build its scaffolding. I, I think that it's not, um, it's not actually so new. Our techniques are new, and I think some of the challenges are new, but um, in terms of the values, they really are being invited into the base measures. Base measures might look different. They may not be able to sit as long. They might need to have their screens with them, but that, as a tradition, that's really what we've done all the time. I think it's a little harder because we have, instead of the select few, leaving home and leaving the family business and going into the base measures who already had shown a certain aptitude, the downside of this dem democratic um, uh, forum is that not everybody is always so capable and always so inclined, and always, so we have to work with many more to accomplish the same goal, um, positives and negatives to it. But I don't think the, the, the methodology and the aim is so different. I just want to add one point to that, and thank you for clarifying also, um, which is that we have, I think we should uh, celebrate our successes in, to a certain degree. And, uh, you know, we focus a lot on the challenges in there, they're considerable, I think. But at the same time, I think there's a recognition even outside the Jewish community that textual engagement actually is prized by Judaism and by the Jewish community and, and the from community in particular. Uh, and uh, just to give one example, and there, there are many. So for example, you have uh, the South Koreans going to the Shiva Mir to see them learning Gemara. This is stunning, if you just think about it. Teaching Gemara ta Talmud in their curriculum, it's remarkable. But we also have a local Christian school that said, oh, we heard that you're the local Jewish school. We understand that you teach Jewish texts. 
in a remarkable way. We have no idea about how to go do this with our Christian students. Would you mind if we come and sit on some of your classes and get a better sense of what you're doing? This is an email that I received recently from a head of school in a local Pennsylvania school. So I think there are challenges, they are considerable, but I think we should take tremendous pride not only in our tradition, but what we continue to uh, accomplish today. And I think that we'd be, uh, we'd be lacking if we didn't uh, celebrate as well. If we have time for one final very quick question, uh, and then we'll have to go. Absolutely. Um, I'll speak to what we're doing at Central because uh, A, my faculty is here. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm quite proud of the, of the time, attention, and resources that we're devoting. Um, it does require a lot of experimentation, a lot of um, support, and um, a lot of uh, humility on everybody's part. I think what, what, what um, the paradigm shift um, that I've observed and I'm trying to develop within our school is that as opposed to teachers being um, masters of their discipline, they are uh, masters of a craft and that craft and their responsibility is not necessarily only to teach Tanakh, but their responsibility is to teach their students. Um, so knowing how to be social, socially, emotionally attuned, knowing how to shift, knowing how to, it, 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 the entire paradigm of a classroom is, is transformed in the sense that I don't walk in prepared and done and ready, I walk in curious. I walk in with a, with a challenge and a, and a question and a whole sort set of resources and I invite my students to join me in this conversation and we figure it out together. That's humility, that's gonna, you're gonna mess up. Um, you're gonna need to be uh, flexible. You're going to need to call in the resources of other Tanakh teachers and other science teachers who have taught these students. Um, there's this uh, lab and experimentation that happens in a classroom that's an entirely different methodology than the traditional, I come in, I have my masters, I know what I'm doing, I've been doing this for 20 years. Um, so it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time from the school um, to give teachers that time, building structures where they can learn from each other, they can go outside to get trained, come in and train each other. Um, visit each other's classrooms, spend time designing, redesigning, um, and that's not something that I would say a typical structured school um, has set up. Um, and it's all, in my opinion, it's all in the, in the infrastructure, in the mission, and in building the support systems. Right. Please uh, join me in thanking our panelists for a very wonderful discussion. <laughs>